At Unreal, we receive a lot of questions all about the Maudsley Depersonalisation Disorder Service in London, from what treatments they offer, how to get referred there, and who ultimately funds the treatment. So today, we've come to the Maudsley in South London to meet with the clinical lead of the service to ask her your questions. So I think a good place to start is a brief introduction of who you are and what you do. Thank you. My name is Dr. Claudia Hallis and I'm a clinical psychologist based at the Depersonalisation Disorder Service at the Maudsley, which is based within the Centre for Anxiety Disorders and Trauma Service. What's the history of the Maudsley Depersonalisation Disorder Service? So the Depersonalisation Disorder Service used to be a kind of standalone research service that was set up, I think, in 1998 by a psychiatrist called um, Dr. Tony David. And he was just really interested in understanding this condition further and doing more research in the area. So it started off as a solely research clinic and now over time it sits within the kind of Centre for Anxiety Disorders and Trauma Service where we treat people clinically. And when someone's referred to the service, what typically happens next? So as the only kind of specialist clinic in the UK, we offer a comprehensive kind of assessment package for people and followed then by a kind of specialist um, treatment package for people. So the assessment looks um, at all of the different factors that has contributed to somebody kind of developing the symptoms that they do and trying to work out um, whether the diagnostic label of depersonalization just sort of fits with their experience and if kind of we assess that it, that it does we'll go on to offer them um, treatment um, all subject to kind of clinical commissioning funding. One thing we get a lot of questions about is the referral process. What has to happen for somebody to be referred to your service? In theory, it should be really straightforward. We have a referral form directly available on our clinic website that um, needs to be filled in by your kind of medical professional, a GP or a psychiatrist who's already involved in your care. Um, and that has a series of kind of questions that help us determine whether you're suitable for our service. And when someone's referred to the service, what typically happens next? So as soon as the referral comes to us, we look at it as a team and have a kind of triage discussion about whether this is the kind of appropriate case for our service or whether actually their needs will be better met elsewhere at a kind of local team. So we will provide kind of immediate feedback at that point to say, yes, this is something that we would be happy to seek kind of funding for an assessment for or actually here are our recommendations for what an alternative kind of um, pathway should be. So um, that's the first step, the kind of the triage of the referral. And then um, we would seek funding if it's appropriate for an assessment, which is kind of up to two hours long, a really in-depth, intense kind of in clinical interview really of how that person's condition has developed, the factors that have kind of led them to experience the symptoms that they do, as well as kind of information about um, previous treatments and current treatments too. And what about the funding process? The funding has to come from somebody's local clinical commissioning care group, which are now integrated care boards. And they hold the purse strings over this kind of national and specialist service, which is a kind of common pathway in the NHS when you hit kind of specialist referrals, um, that they need specialist funding. So we, at the end of our assessment process, write a really extensive assessment report and make a case to the commissioners for that funding to be released. And you know, typically that goes through without a problem. And then the same thing happens for treatment. So once the assessment uh, report has been written, we ask for kind of treatment funding. To be referred to the service, does the individual have to be living within the UK? Yes, because the purse strings are held by kind of UK clinical commissioning groups that are linked to people's UK GP surgeries, we can only see patients who are registered in the, in the UK. So we're here in South London. Once a patient's been assessed and they've been confirmed for therapy, do they have to travel to South London? Well, that's kind of been the blessing of COVID in some ways, that historically we had been a kind of in-person only service, which had meant kind of lengthy train journeys from far-flung places of the country. And since actually now the way the world works is that we're much better at working online, we now offer kind of virtual sessions as well um, as kind of a hybrid approach. We would still really encourage face-to-face -face working 
possible and it's kind of one of the conditions to say are you willing to travel face to face because we think that still is the best evidence to do the work face to face but of course yeah the travel it can be an issue so we're really pleased to be able to offer virtual work to you. What sort of therapies do you offer as part of the service? So we are um, commissioned to provide a specialist cognitive behavioural therapy for depersonalisation, derealisation disorder. So it's a really um, high specialist and tailored approach to treating depersonalisation disorder, which typically people haven't ever had the opportunity to do before. They may have had kind of more generic CBT coping tools, but here we really kind of try and link it all specifically to the depersonalisation and what keeps it going. Um, as psychological professionals, we're all trained in a variety of um, therapeutic approaches, so we might draw on other different therapeutic models like um, acceptance and commitment therapy or compassion-focused therapy when we're doing our work, but um, we are funded for cognitive behavioural therapy in the main. And does medication play into the treatment plan here? Yes, as part of our assessment process, we have um, a pool of really skilled psychiatrists based in our service who will offer a standalone um, psychiatric medication consultation if and when required um, in that assessment process and that can be reviewed um, over the course of treatment as well. From somebody walking through the door on day one to the point of discharge, what does a typical course of therapy look like? So we would typically ask for funding for up to kind of a minimum of 16 um, therapy sessions and that can be extended or it could be we could end sooner than that. It's kind of a, a rough ballpark but um, essentially it's a kind of one hour a week treatment um, that yeah, is either face to face or online and the frequency of that may kind of tail off towards the end of therapy as people kind of feel ready for discharge kind of moving to bi-weekly. And I think the last thing to ask is where can people find out more information about your service? So please do get in contact with us. We are friendly and very happy to reply to emails, but we also have a website um, where you can kind of read further information about the condition, links to further resources. Um, we've got individual kind of leaflets that we've developed within our service and our clinical team that say our understanding of what depersonalization disorder is and how cognitive behavioral therapy might be able to um, help. And we'll link to that information in the description box below.